Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at a very interesting office called the Human Development Report Office and some, talk about some of the studies and reports that it's done over the past 12 years. My guest today is an expert on this office and on these topics. My guest today is Mr. Salim Jahan. Mr. Salim Jahan is the director of the Human Development Report Office at the United Nations Development Program. Mr. Jahan has been involved in the preparation of 12 human development reports, being the lead author of the last two. Mr. Salim Jahan, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. It's good to be back. Yeah, I should say welcome <laughs> back <laughs> because you've got so much going on with these human development right. reports. We could probably do an interview about every month or Absolutely. so, I would guess. Absolutely. Yes. But I'm delighted you're back. But let's talk a little bit about the uh, Human Development Report Office. What is it and basically what is its mission? Um, the Human Development Report Office is a unit within UNDP, mm -hmm. but it also enjoys uh, editorial independence, which was given to us by the General Assembly Resolution. Um, its mission are threefold. One is uh, it wants to provide inputs to the global debate and dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, second, it wants to ensure the global thought leadership of UNDP. Mm -hmm. And third, it's also a document which actually encourages policy debates, dialogues in countries at the global level on the broader issues of development. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about human development, I guess the two words are self-explanatory, but how do you, do you have a broad definition of human development? Yeah, I think we do. I mean, uh, every time or every um, day, we make different kind of choices mm -hmm. at the individual level, at the societal level, at the national, and also at the global level. Some of the choices are political, some are social, some economic, mm -hmm. some cultural. Uh, the ultimate objective of human development is actually to broaden your choices. And we say that uh, it's the enlargement of choices which is at the core of human development. And you enlarge your choices on one hand to um, increase your capabilities, expanding your capabilities, and the, on the other hand, basically, by enhancing your opportunities. So human development in the ultimate analysis mm -hmm. is development of the people for the people and by the people. And the improvement yeah. of the human condition. Absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt, Absolutely. yes. Well, we won't have time to go through all 12 sure. reports, but we do happen to have a couple handy. And this one is from 2016. Correct. And this is human development for everyone that uh, we could, I'll try to show this to the camera <laughs> if I can find the camera. But uh, what, what was the thrust of this human development for everyone 2016 report? I think the thrust were threefold. One was that uh, when we say human development, it actually, um, talks about universality. Um, human development should not only for the few, or it should not be for the most even, mm -hmm. but it should be everyone. And that is at the core of the uh, 2030 development agenda also. When we talk about no one left behind, it's basically the universalism that we talks about. So that's one aspect of um, the report that you have just mentioned. Uh, the second thrust was that if we look back to the past 25 years, um, development has happened in many fields, but not everybody has benefited from that. Uh, boats have been lifted, but not all boats, and not to the same extent. So therefore, when we talk about human development for everyone, we want to ensure that uh, the fruits of development are enjoyed by every human being, because every human life is equally valuable. And the third thrust of that, we talked about policies. So what are the policies that are needed at the national level, at the global level, in order to ensure that we can reach the person who is at the farthest? Because if we do that, then only then you can ensure mm -hmm. that the fruits of development would reach everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals, right. the 2030 Development Agenda. Mm -hmm. And of course, these were developed in 20, adopted in 2015, Correct. implemented January 1st, mm -hmm. or came online mm -hmm. January 1st, 2016, and they'll run for 15 years to 2030. Mm -hmm. And they're very ambitious, but measurable and Absolutely. accomplishable mm -hmm. goals mm -hmm. in that they want to eliminate poverty. Mm -hmm. want to eliminate hunger, mm -hmm. want to empower women and, and girls, Correct. want to preserve the environment, and mm -hmm. just on across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 17 goals, and I think 169 targets. targets. So right. it's a, but it, there's something there for everybody. Mm -hmm. it, it does not matter what your organization mm -hmm. is or what your particular interest is, but there's something there to be supportive of. But when we talk about no one left behind, that was more or less the theme of the development goal, uh, the sustainable development goals. How, how can we make sure that no one is left behind? We have 
7.4 billion people on the planet now, mm -hmm. and by 2030, we'll probably be pushing eight and a half, or I'm guessing at that. Mm -hmm. But how can we make sure that we don't leave people behind so that they don't have health care, that they don't have meaningful employment, that they don't have sufficient education, and those types of really uh, enjoyments of life to help them improve their lives and right. their societies. I think uh, three things <coughs> needed to be done on that front. One is that mm -hmm. there has to be a realization that development is for everybody. Development cannot be divided or development cannot mm -hmm. be partial. So in our analytical framework, in our thought process, if we th actually want to ensure that development should reach uh, everyone, then the whole question of the analytical approach should uh, change and that is one of the thrust in the 2030 development agenda when the agenda was adapted. The second thing is the, uh, is to do with data and information. Um, if w you want to reach everyone, then you have to know who they are and where they are. There are 800 million people who are not part of any statistics or any data, and that's mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. therefore, I think the data and the statistics should be uh, so comprehensive that you bring all the people from all walks of life in different parts of the world into the arena of your measurement, assessment, as well as uh, your data and statistics. The third are policies. I mean, when we talk about policies, those should be taken at national, global, uh, regional level. At the national level, there have to be certain policies which are universal. Uh, we should have inclusive mm -hmm. economic growth. I mean, many countries are growing, but the fruits of uh, growth are not reaching those who needed them most. We also need women's empowerment because you cannot have universal um, growth and universal development by neglecting half of the population. Mm -hmm. Then at the national level, you also need targeted uh, interventions. There are groups of people, uh, indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, uh, ethnic minorities, who may not benefit as much as the other groups would benefit from overall policies. So you need targeted interventions tailored to the needs of those groups there. Then you have to make your development resilient because even if you develop, even if you grow, even if you uh, progress, there is a chance that you may slide down or slide back uh, to uh, where you have been. So you have to make it resilient, not only in the environmental sense, but also social, cultural, every mm -hmm. sense. And finally, development would be actually sustainable if you bring people uh, in your development process, not only as the beneficiary, but also as active participant in making decisions. So those are some of the things you do at the national level. At the global level, there is a need for reforms of global institutions. I mean, the global institutions that we see around us <coughs> have been um, brought in after the Second World War. That was a different world. Um, now the world has changed. The power structure has changed. The growth centers have also shifted. So you need a different kind of global institutions with new rules, uh, mm -hmm. new games, so that you actually bring all the countries, all the nations around the world in, uh, in that debate, in the dialogue, in determining the future of the humankind. Mm -hmm. Now, our viewers can go to your website, www.hdr.undp.org, to get more information about Absolutely. what we're talking about today. Sure. You talk about the global institutions, mm -hmm. and of course, we look at the major global institutions, the United Nations came out of the ashes of World War II in true, 1945. True, true. We saw the International Monetary Fund, the, mm -hmm. the World Bank, different ones like that. We saw the whole, really the whole structure was set up really after World War II true. that we're using today. What types, are there uh, specific recommendations on some institution or an institution that should make these changes. I, we've heard this from a lot of quarters. Right. A lot of people have right. said it, and uh, I think they're right. But is there, are there a couple of suggestions on how the one could change to be more inclusive, to be more comprehensive, to be more uh, really a frontline type of support mm -hmm. to peoples around the world? I think things are happening. I mean, um, uh, you and I have been with the UN for quite some time. And there was a time when UN used to be dominated by the member states. And now the civil society organizations are part of the debate and the dialogue and the events within the UN. They have a voice. And I think that has made a change. 
similarly, there are talks among member states uh, within different groups in the UN that there have to be some kind of reform in terms of representation, for example, in terms of focus of mm -hmm. some of the uh, units mm -hmm. with the UN system, uh, how we deal with the whole question of development and peace as one package. So I think some of those debates and dialogues will have to take place so that we know what kind of framework do we need to push them forward. Now, if you look at the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's the World Bank or the IMF, the whole question of representation is very important. And I think there have been some changes in terms of the representation of China or India, um, where they now have better representations in those global institutions. Uh, the whole question of transparency and accountability uh, of uh, financial organizations like the bank and the fund are important. Uh, they now have set up um, the independent evaluation offices, which are independent of both the institutions, to do their kind of the assessment of their work. The governance structure of um, different uh, international organizations are coming uh, to debate and dialogues. So I think it's a question of keeping the dialogue continue mm -hmm. because if we continue the dialogue through different kinds of um, uh, feedbacks different kind of interactions we will come up with the solutions I mean we have been working with these institutions for more than 50 years and we don't expect that everything will change overnight and we want to do it in a democratic way we want to do it in a participatory way so therefore through debates and through dialogues I think we'll come up with certain things where these institutions will also be geared towards human development on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're looking, I guess we define terms differently today. We have different standards of our values have changed. When the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was right. drafted in 1948, that was a benchmark document, and it right. still is today. It, precisely. it is very comprehensive, and mm -hmm. we look at it, but uh, so often when we're talking about these issues today, we see that health is viewed now by a large number of people as a human right. right. And so, uh, so that thinking has evolved mm -hmm. over the past mm -hmm. several years. Mm -hmm. Climate change, mm -hmm. we never even talked about climate change in 1948, mm -hmm. I'm assuming they mm -hmm. didn't, but that wasn't even on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So there have been so many issues that have arisen that we need to deal with that, and we need to interpret them differently, do we not, sure. as the way we did then? No, we have to um, interpret it different, differently. We have to look at them through a different lens. I mean, if you look at the challenges that uh, human development faces today, if I uh, take that particular route, then there are certain challenges which are what I call lingering. The whole question of poverty, deprivations are lingering. They're lingering from one decade to another. Um, we have been working on those issues for more than uh, half, I mean, uh, uh, half a century, but still there are um, these problems in different parts of the world. So we have to deal with those lingering um, problems. Then there are emerging issues. And when I say emerging issues, uh, for example, the climate change that mm -hmm. you have talked about, uh, there are global epidemics, uh, Ebola, Zika, uh, that we have seen. So those emerging issues we have to uh, deal with because these are not only environmental issues or health issues, these are development issues. I mean, if we don't <laughs> deal with climate change uh, right now, then those um, there are 100 million people who will be pushed into poverty by 2030, and that's a huge number. So if 100 million additional people are pushed into uh, poverty in 17 years or in 13 years' time, <laughs> then what happens is that the gains that you have made on the poverty front uh, would be eroded. Um, then there are also uh, problems which are uh, very important to look at, inequalities. Uh, inequality uh, is the defining issue of our time. It's not a question of um, uh, capitalism or a question of uh, societal imbalances. It's a question of democracy too. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, I think when you have a world where eight billion years has as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the global population, which makes one billion year worth of 462 million people, if my math is right, <laughs> um, yes. that's uh, an unequal world that we are talking about. So we have uh, problems which are lingering. Uh, we have problems which are basically penetrating, which are also problems uh, which are emerging. So I think we have to deal with those challenges <laughs> and have to look at it in a more integrated manner 
uh, not uh, as isolated issues, more as development issues, not as environmental or peace issues, because th all those things in a globalized world is now uh, intertwined. So you cannot just say that I will look at A and avoid B, or look at C and then I will <coughs> deal with D. That's not going to happen and that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website, you like our shows, and you would like to share them, please do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're talking with Mr. Salim Jahan, who is currently serving as the Director of the Human Development Report Office right. in the United Nations Development Program. Salim, we're talking about right. the importance of all of these issues, and we're we're taking a different approach. We're talking about income inequality. Let's let's talk about how we've gauged income inequality over the years. We were talking oh, so often. We've heard of the GDP, the gross domestic product, mm -hmm. or per capita income (PCI). Mm -hmm. How are should we be using those? Those are economic terms. Mm -hmm. Those are from the business community. Should we be using those, or should be broadening that? with this, um, this basically human development approach that you're talking about? I think it's both. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that we should <coughs> throw away the baby with the uh, <laughs> Right, don't water. toss it. No, <laughs> exactly. Um, right. Both. Because uh, GDP, uh, the time has not come that GDP should rest in peace. Uh, mm -hmm. It has its own value. Uh, it has its own area where it can be very effective. I mean, if you look at the economic production, if you want to assess how much have been produced uh, in a cut particular country or in an economy, you would need a yardstick to measure it. And I think the gross domestic product does that. But at the same time, you also want to assess the broader aspects of human life. Uh, income is not the sum total of human life. I mean, there are other aspects of human life which are very important. And that's where the human development um, approach comes in. Um, you want to be healthy. You want to uh, lead a long and productive life, uh, you want to be knowledgeable, you want security, you want to participate in those things which affect your life. So the human development approach says that um, in order to have a better measure or better assessment of human well-being, there have to be some kind of a measurement or assessment of these broader aspects. Can we be comprehensive? No. Um, so therefore the human development index, uh, which is a composite measure of knowledge, health, and standard of living mm -hmm. is a comprehensive measure. But it, but it is as vulgar as GDP, but it is not as blind <laughs> as GDP <laughs> to the broader aspects of human uh, life. Uh, may I quote uh, uh, Robert Kennedy, I mean, Please. from the Kansas University, I think in 1968. Uh, he said that, I mean, GDP is a wonderful thing, but in GDP we measure everything. We measure production, mm -hmm. we measure the locks that we put on the gates of our uh, jails. Uh, we measure also the production of opium. Uh, mm -hmm. So all those things are part of GDP. But in that particular measurement, we don't measure our creativity, we don't measure our poems, we don't measure the love for each other, we don't measure the love of mothers for their children. So therefore, GDP measures everything that are mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but it may not measure the most important things in life which makes life worthwhile. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> With there are additional elements that right. round out that particular Correct. human human enterprise, shall we say, or human development. And while we're talking about that, though, are we moving more towards looking at some of the costs? We talked about the GDP and the per capita income. We look at X number of jobs produced, let's say, by the fossil fuel right, industry. Right. We know the fossil fuels are contributing to climate change. Mm -hmm. They're putting out more and more CO2 and mm -hmm. that type of thing. But when we're looking at the, the overall economic impact, do we factor in things such as air pollution? Do we talk about people who are developing respiratory diseases? Mm -hmm. We look at some of the cities, especially some of the Indian cities, mm -hmm. uh, some of the most polluted in the world, and mm -hmm. they're not by themselves. Right, there are many right, others right, around. Right. China has a severe problem. But should we, water purification, uh, should we be factoring in all of that, the toll on the environment and the toll on humans 
by having certain types of production and perhaps the production of fossil fuels. I'm just using that as one no, example. No, 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 we could talk about yes, everything. Yes. But shouldn't we broaden that definition? Or are we doing that today? I think we're doing it at two levels. At one <coughs> level, I mean, when we are assessing our success or our progress, I think some of those considerations are coming in. So in a uh, country like Costa Rica, they're looking at GDP, but they're also discounting uh, the kind of the damage that is being done in to environment. Uh, similarly, in the human development approach, we are not looking at pure life expectancy. We, what we call, we are laughing, um, uh, we are referring to it as uh, health-adjusted life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So, if you live 80 years and you have had 20 years um, lying in bed or uh, um, remaining sick, mm -hmm. uh, your quality of life is not same as if you have lived, uh, would have lived uh, 80 years without any disease or something like that. So I think the costs of some of those things are coming into the assessment as well as in the evaluation of our progress. Mm -hmm. But then the second part of the whole thing is that when you talk about that fundamentally we have to change our lifestyle and we have to change the way we produce. Uh, because the consumption and production uh, we have to think it, and I'm just thinking uh, from the perspective of human development. Mm -hmm. It can, cannot continue the way it continues now, uh, mainly because that if you do that, then the kind of the damage that you are going to do to natural resources and environment, you would actually shrink the opportunities of future generations. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about human development and uh, enlarging choices of people, it's not only the current generation that we are concerned about, it is also the future generation. So therefore, I think from that perspective of intergenerational equity, uh, it is important to look at production, the look at consumption patterns, the way you actually dump your vestiges, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. how much do we need, and that kind of thing. Um, dollars 36 billion worth of food stuff is um, uh, I mean just you uh, they are not used anyway in the United States and that's a huge number mm -hmm. and r if some of the food stuff that is wasted worldwide you could actually feed at least more than 700 million people so I think we have to take those numbers um, more seriously and have to see what can be done about those mm -hmm. things. Most assuredly. Now, uh, you've done so many topics in the past. Right. We, we've talked about the future of work, <coughs> excuse me, different uh, items like that. Uh, what do you see on the horizon uh, in the last minute we have? Are there some other topics that you will be dealing with right. in the future? I think um, uh, over the last uh, 20 years, 25 years, the Human Development Report has touched upon lots of interesting themes from gender equality to democracy, from cultural diversity to mm -hmm. consumption, uh, from uh, globalization to environmental sustainability and everything. I think there are two or three issues that need to be looked at. One that comes to my mind is the whole question of conflict and human development. I mean, do we know what does human development mean in a country like Syria right now? Mm -hmm. Or what human development means to a child in Aleppo? Uh, human development may mean to them only human survival. I mean, do I die sitting in uh, Aleppo or do I die while I try to cross the Mediterranean? Maybe that's the only choice they have. So that would be very interesting. Uh, I think uh, the whole issue of inequality and human development would also be very, very interesting, where we can bring in the whole question of the quality of human mm -hmm. development, unequal human um, development outcomes. That would be quite interesting. And I personally also think that the issue of gender equality should be brought in once again. I mean, we have done a report on gender equality more than 20 20 years ago, but time has come to look at that particular aspect because I think mm -hmm. this is absolutely important <coughs> right now. It certainly is, and there are many experts who really believe that we, well, climate change is absolutely. our number one problem no. without doubt because no. it affects all 7.4 billion people, but by the same token, there are some others such as nuclear proliferation, which is an extremely important uh -huh. topic, uh -huh. but income inequality is certainly bringing up into, uh -huh. rushing into third place, uh -huh. and it's something that is 
has the potential of disrupting society Absolutely. in many areas Absolutely. of the world. And you're seeing so much of it, as you very mm -hmm. well know, especially in countries like the United States that didn't have this problem mm -hmm. uh, 20, 25 years ago, or as much as it did today. Mm -hmm. There's always been some income inequality. But these are the issues that are so important and that we need, and you're certainly providing a tremendous service by focusing the spotlight on them and coming up with specific recommendations on how to deal with these problems and to really focus upon this human development approach. But Mr. Mr. Salim Jahan, I want to thank you so very much thank for you a very, very interesting and thank a very you. informative thank program. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be with My you. My pleasure. We'll have to do thank it more you. often. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.